Good evening and welcome to Livid Comics Lair. Tonight's guest is the founder of CemeteryDance.com. Uh, he's also worked with Chesapeake Films. There's another program that he created that he makes some movies. Um, he's got a book out right now, guys, called Chasing the Boogeyman. He's a very well-known and wonderful horror thriller author. So please welcome our friend, Mr. Richard Chismar. <laughs> I need you guys to do one of those author photos of me, please. I mean, drawings. I could do that. Yeah, I could do that for yeah, you. Yeah, that's I'll cool. I saw those. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I want, I want one of those. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll hook you up. I'll make that happen. That's, that's an easy request. Yeah, that was totally um, a play on the the, uh, the vault keep, yeah, you know, the the vault uh, keeper, the crypt keeper, you know, the old yeah. witch from uh, EC. Definitely. Yeah, that's a, definitely my vibe. And I got the vault of horror shirt on tonight. So, <laughs> yeah, do that. Rocking that stuff. Yeah, big fan. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's hard to do an intro on you, Richard, because you got so many uh, accolades. It's hard to fit it all in there, so just you know try what? to bang through some things. So. <laughs> yeah, like that long ass version of my bio, <clears throat> which I, I think is on the, I think it's on my website. So I think that's where, I think that's where most people get it. And it's like, yeah, I need to put, I need to put a nice, succinct, like three sentence job on there. And, Could it be uh, done? Is it even feasible? I mean, you got so much cool stuff. Yeah, I actually I did it. <laughs> I did it for something else. And I don't remember what it was. Maybe it was like a, uh, an anthology or something. They asked for a bio just within the last like three days. And I, it shows you what my memory's like. I can't even remember what the hell it was for. But yeah, <laughs> I, I like took that bio and I just cut it to pieces and updated something and, and I sent it. I'm like, that's good. You don't need to yeah. know all that other stuff. It's yeah. a tough thing. I was in the fine art world. And I always wanted you to have like an artist statement. Um, I did that for a long time. I was like, I don't know what my statement is. You, you, you tell me. You know, that's kind of like always my jam. So it's a hard thing to come yeah. up with. Yeah, I don't know what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. What do you? I mean, is that kind of like along the lines of writing the synopsis for the back of the book? Like, um, I feel like a lot of authors say that's like harder than actually writing the book. That coming up with a summary to explain the book um, and the plot without giving too much away. Um, uh, yeah, usually I go to my go-to guys are Brian Freeman, who who you know uh, works at CD and, and runs his own press, and he's a really good writer. And then Bev Vincent, who's another really good writer. I usually those are my go-to guys. I'm like, can you can you try a synopsis, and then I'm fine tweaking it and massaging it here and there. But writing them from scratch sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I have the uh, tendency to to give a lot away in the plot when I when I try to do it. Like when I was doing it for our comic book, I'm explaining it on interviews to, uh, to promote. I'm like, yeah, I just told you the whole plot. So um, <laughs> here's <laughs> my outline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Um, I was excited uh, to get you on. Um, like I said on social media, uh, chasing the boogeyman was one of the books I was most excited to read this year. So thank and you. And I. Yeah, absolutely. And I intentionally timed it so I would finish it like a week or so before this interview. So I wouldn't, it would be fresh in my mind. So, um, but uh, again, I'll try not to, I'm not going to spoil a lot of the book in case a lot of the viewers <laughs> haven't, haven't, haven't read it. Um, no, it's, the all the spoilers are out there now. It's all right. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> and it doesn't ready. even matter. I mean, some of the spoilers are like printed right on the book and it doesn't matter. I, that's, uh, that's been one of the cool things about this is realizing that it doesn't matter, you know, cause I fought a lot of those, you know, like the disclaimer and I didn't want to have a novel on the front cover and all that. But I, I found out after the fact, it doesn't matter. People believe what they want to believe. So. Sure. Yeah. And there's enough mystery in the book too, where even if you think you're telling a spoiler, there's still some, some unanswered stuff towards the end there that Joel and I were talking about just the other day um, towards the end of the book. Um, so but, but yeah, um, so um, with Chasing the Boogeyman, um, that, I mean, that's what, on, did you say it's on like the fifth, sixth print already? Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, fourth, fourth or fifth? Uh, fourth or fifth? Four printings, but it might be fifth. Yeah, I, I lost track. But yeah, I mean, I'm shocked it, it went to two because, it, you know, it had a really healthy first printing and um, 
the fact that, uh, yeah, that they've had to go back to press a bunch of times has just been, you know, kind of a cool, cool surprise for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we both, yeah, we both read it. got through it. So that we were here for it for the show. So we made sure we we're prepared for that too. Um, so to me, it felt like um, almost like a love letter that you were writing uh, in terms of being sentimental to your youth. Um, what was that like emotionally for you to go back and revisit some of those things? Like you, uh, you speak finally of your parents and your childhood and those memories. What was that journey like for you writing that uh, emotionally for you? It, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, I didn't, uh, you know, I tapped into some, some pretty far back memories, like you said. Um, but, and, and they're all true. All the stuff I talked about from my childhood and growing up there, um, you know, all the interactions with my parents, you know, all that stuff is, is as true as I could, uh, you know, get it on the page. People have asked me, did you, uh, did you feel like you, did you embellish or did you feel like you had to? And I'm like, no, you know, we had, we had a cool childhood and we did, you know, we got up to a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of fun. It was a different time period, you know, um, and a different place then. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just had fun. It, don't, it felt like a guilty pleasure at times working on the book because, you know, my parents are gone. But for the three or four months I worked on the book, they were back. Um, you yeah. know, all my friends, we were together. We were, doing this, you know, we were up to uh, to our old, uh, you know, tricks. And, uh, yeah, it was just a lot of fun. And I always feel weird saying that because the book's about a serial killer and, <laughs> four, and some, you know, young girls being killed. And I have to say, well, you know, that stuff wasn't, you know. But, yeah, it was uh, – it was definitely probably the quickest I've written something of that length. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, like I said, the, the, the key word there was I just really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I, I it, the, the whole book was kind of just like a happy surprise for me. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't set off to the only thing I knew going in is that I wanted to model it after a true crime book. Um, yeah. I had no idea that, uh, you know, I was going to delve that deeply into my hometown. Um, certainly had no idea I was going to make myself the main character. I mean, that's like really out of character for me because I'm a behind the scenes guy and, and I don't get out much. I don't go many conventions or that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, you know, next thing I know I'm writing about myself and my agent, you know, I, I'd saved it until I was finished to tell my agent. Yeah. That was a fun <laughs> phone call. She said, you did what? I was like, just read it. Give me your opinion. You wrote a whole book. <laughs> I didn't even know. <laughs> That's awesome. Yep. Uh, so yep. Yeah, I, you know, I love the book. Uh, like I said, it's one of my favorite books this year. I, I, you know, the whole fascination with serial killers and, and all that. Um, so I think I mentioned it on the show once, Joel, but uh, coincidentally, we, my hometown, Newport, New Hampshire, we actually had a serial killer um, before I was born. And there's, there's an unsolved mysteries episode based on, on it. Um, wow. And yeah, it wasn't just my town. It was the surrounding area too, but there was like three or four murders from my town back in, I think, late seventies. Um, so um, I, you know, that, that intrigues me, you know, um, going back to, um, you know, seeing how, you know, again, like you said, it's a, not, a, not a nice topic necessarily, but, um, it's fascinating to go back and see how it impacted the, the towns and reading the newspapers at that point in time that, you know, how people were reacting, um, all that. So, um, and that's, and that's kind of exactly what the book is about, how, that, that yeah. kind of pull between, you know, being repulsed by, you know, bad things that are happening, but also being fascinated by them and that that push pull that, uh, you know, you're a good guy. So you don't want these things to happen. But at the same time, because you're so interested in 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 the dark side of humanity, you can't help but be fascinated by it. And I tried to really get that across in the book that, you know, if these murders were happening, 22 year old me, um, would absolutely be repulsed by him, but yeah, yeah, you know, no denying it. I'd also be fascinated by what was going on and I'd be probably sticking my nose where it didn't belong. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Actually driving by the, the crime scenes and checking it all out and uh, all that. Um, For sure. Yeah. Um, so um, I was going to um, ask, uh, Joel and I were talking about this um, yesterday, I believe, um, at the end of the book with the interview um, with Gallagher, um, your character asked him about the meaning of, of the hop, the, you know, the, the, the number sequences and so forth. And he just left it as, you know, I'm not ready to talk about that. Um, 
are we going to uh, find out at any point in anything in the future, the meaning behind that, or is it just uh, something where you know, leave it to the imagination? Yeah, I, I think you will. Um, when I, when I wrote it and, and when I turned the book in, I, you know, I didn't really have any thoughts of doing a sequel or continuing the story. Um, but, and, 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 you know, I purposely ended the book that way because, you know, that's how life works. It doesn't end up neat and, right. you know, orderly, uh, especially murder investigations. And, and that's one of the things I got from talking to a lot of, uh, police and, and detectives. Um, but, uh, the more I thought about it, just, you know, I feel like there's, you know, I, I, what I did is probably about a month ago, I, I without even trying to, I just, I got, I got a cl really clear picture in my head of what chapter one would be of a sequel. And it ends with such a kind of a gut punch that I thought, oh, Christ, I have to, you know, even if I'm not going to do a sequel, I have to write that chapter. And then I started thinking, but it would be really cool if that chapter one was in the back of the trade paperback of Chasing the Boogeyman when that came out next summer. So that got my, you know, the wheels turning. And I just, so I, I have talked to my agent and the publisher about it. And, you know, there's a little trepidation, you know, about, you know, the, the sequels being a letdown and that kind of thing. So, you know, we'll see if I can, if I can put together a full narrative, you know, that I think would, uh, would measure up, then I would definitely love to do it. Cause I, you know, I have some of those answers. Some of them I don't even know myself, so I'll figure right. it out as I go. Yeah. But yeah, I purposely know. have some stuff. Yeah. Did you always know that the story was going to be written in first person or did you try out some other formats first and then said, no, I got to I got to be the lead in this? Or what was that like, too? I knew it was going to be first person. And and I was writing I was actually writing the introduction to the book um, pretty much the way it is right now. And really early on, like two or three pages in, I'm like, you know what? I can't fake this because, you know, you, you always put a little. Well, you're not always, but you often put a little bit of yourself in your stories and and especially when they're first person narration. Um, but this one, I, I it's just like after two or three pages, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be able to fake that this person isn't me. So I'm you know, because everything was was right in line with how it really happened. I, I did come home. Uh, after I graduated college for like nine months because I was going to get married. And I was like, yeah, I'll save some money and eat my parents' food. And uh, and it was a really interesting time because I had just started Cemetery Dance Magazine. And so, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got this degree, which I have no intention of using. And I'm doing this little magazine and I'm writing my stories and sending them out and, and you know, to small press mags. And, um, and I'm living in the bedroom that I grew up in, you know, and I'm kind of surrounded by the ghosts of, of the past. And it was a cool time. Um, and there were there was some bad stuff going on in the neighborhood. There was a guy who was breaking into houses and, and caressing sleeping women, their hair and their arms and their legs. And and then the newspaper called him the Phantom Fondler. And it did change the town. I mean, it was it was a little bit like the like the first time I saw Scream, the movie. I was like, that's what it was like in Edgewood for a while. You know, they yeah. started talking about curfews and people were talking about buying guns and setting traps and. They were buying, uh, you know, motion detector spotlights and it, it and gossip was going everywhere. And uh, th this guy broke into like over 30 homes and did this. I and mean, he wasn't caught until many years later for something else. Um, so, so, yeah, it, like I was halfway through that. I, not even halfway. I was probably the third of the way into the introduction. And I just said, you know what? I'm just going to write about myself if if. Uh, you know, if, if no one wants to read about some schmuck from Edgewood, that's fine. I understand that. And, uh, you know, but and when I was finished, I warned my agent. I said, I didn't tell you I was writing this book because I didn't want you to talk me out of it. But here it is. And uh, she'll admit to, to this day that, you know, she kind of gave me the cross eyed look. And then she, about a week later, she called me and she said, all right, you won me over. This is good. So <laughs> I, uh, I got a little confidence from that. But, yeah, I, I thought I was a little crazy myself. I, I think it works in the format, though. I don't know how else you would pull it off, right? Unless you made someone entirely fictitious. But to your point, your your, your immediate circle would say, "Hey, no, Rich, you're telling your story, right?" So people in your friends and family circle would be yeah. like, "Oh, that's you." Yeah. So, yeah exactly. Well, I was fascinated by. Like, I love true crime books, and I was I, I I was and still am fascinated with some of these true crime writers who who become so immersed in the stories. That, that yeah. they take over their lives. And, and, you know, the guy who wrote the introduction to the book um, has, has examples of that. And, and uh, the, what Michelle McNamara and the, you know, the popular H, HBO yeah. one that I'm going to forget the title of, uh, alone, uh, what is it called? Oh Shit. man, I watched it all. Um, it <laughs> yeah. It's called I'll Be Going yeah. in the Dark. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then James, I think James Renner who wrote the introduction, I think his is called True Crime. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, and there's a lot of examples of these people who just you know, there's so much research and so much emotion that goes into it. You can't help but kind of it's like quicksand, you know, it sucks you in. And so, yeah, when I when I when I made that decision, it fit perfectly with what I was trying to do. And that was the true crime angle with the photos and all that. Yeah. Um, so uh, going back to the be the beginning, the early days. So you started Cemetery Dance in in the 80s um w when you started that was that was your was your dream to to start um a, a company like that you know uh, create a magazine and, and and go from there i mean did you deep down know you wanted to write novels um you know um yeah, yeah well i was a writer first i mean that's the thing i uh i started submitting short stories i was probably my junior year in college and I started the magazine as a senior. And the reason I did it is because, you know, it was twofold. One was I, I was actually fortunate enough to sell, you know, a decent number of stories. And I would get the contributor copies in the mail. And I was like, you know, half I, I'd say about half of them I was really proud to appear in. And I was like, you know, showing my family and friends and saying, hey, this is cool, you know. And then the other half, I was just like too embarrassed to show to anybody because the quality was so poor. You know, they were yeah. falling apart. The, the artwork looked like something I could have done. And I'm a horrible artist. I mean, you know, I can't draw. <laughs> I draw stick figures. And um, so, yeah, I, uh, I I saw that and and that, you know, you're young. I always say I was young and dumb enough to think I could do better. And that's where the original kind of germ of the thought came from. And then there was a magazine back there called The Horror Show. Um, this guy, Dave Silva out in California, published it and edited it. And I found out that he did that. He was pretty much a one man show. He had freelancers, you know, of course, doing articles and but he designed everything. He edited everything. He proofread it. He got the ads, you know, sent it off to the printer and, you know, handle subscriptions and all of that. So when I found out he did it by himself, that that was kind of the final thing for me. I was like, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just jumped in and started the magazine and then. You know, I figured it would tie into my writing, which it did for, you know, three or four years. But then once the book started, the publishing company kind of took over and the writing really took a back seat for a while. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, I my true passion is to write novels. That's that's the that's the dream. Um, and, and Joel knew that. So we we worked together at our day job and um, he he's a, he was a fine artist and had art shows in Boston and whatnot and um, asked if I wanted to to write comics so um, I had never done that before but it's been such a great you know segue to now I actually am trying to write you know novels novellas short stories and and, and submit them and I never was doing that before we started comics so um, awesome. I, yeah it's uh, you know. A, a dream you know it, it's uh, i always like hearing the beginning of people's um stories because you know, that's where i'm at now you know so selfishly it's always it's always nice to hear you know how the start went and you know what you went through and, and so forth so um yeah i mean and, and you know what i i envy the fact that you guys have each other because that's that's uh it was a very solitary thing for me you know i was uh you know like i said i was i was 20 21 going on 22 um, yeah. So I think that summer I was 22 when I was reading submissions and the first issue was published, but yeah, you know, and I, I, I kind of, you know, I talked to as many people as I could, Dave Silva from the horror show, God bless him. I, you know, I was on the phone with him like twice a week. Um, <laughs> but there was nobody close to me. My roommate, one of my college roommates, it was a good artist. So he did like all the initial art, um, for like the first issue, um, and did a lot of my ad, you know, my advertisement, he did the art for those. Um, but, you know, he he wasn't immersed in the genre like I was. So, it, yeah, it's cool to have a partner to bounce things off of and to uh, kind of, you know, bring you up when you're down and all that. You know, my poor fiance, you know, she was stuck <laughs> with me, struggling for yeah. like the next 10 years. And, yeah, you know, those first 10 years were were rough, but, you know, I had the passion and the work ethic to kind of get through it. That's what we talk about all the time is you, you need that passion and work ethic. You can't go in expecting to, to get rich off it. You know, if you're doing it, like we're not expecting to get rich off doing comic books, you know, but it's, uh, we have solid day jobs, but we, it's a passion. That's what we want to do. You know, at the end of the day, if we could do that for a living and make even close to what we're making in our day jobs, we would run away with that, you know? Uh, yeah. And, you know what? and, and yeah, if the passion's there, then, you know, it, anything can happen. You know, you guys get a hit comic or or, you know, you land something else from somebody else that that, uh, you know, sells well for you. Uh, you never know. I mean, I, I did. I didn't even really, th you know, 
I didn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't married, you know, until after the first issue came out, I, uh, uh, no kids, no mortgage, none of that. So I didn't have a lot of that, you know, hanging over my head so I could really kind of go all in. And I did, you know, uh, all those credit cards, they send the, the dumb college kids. <laughs> you know, that's, that's how, I, that's how I finance the business. So yeah. That's awesome. uh, I always say I, I finance it off like that 21% interest that they send the dummies, but right. no, one, no one else was going to give me money. Right. <laughs> yeah. I can remember those days early on too. I, I had an automotive parts business about that age uh, doing that too. I started with uh, about $40 from my mom to open the business bank account. That's how broke I was doing this thing. And I started putting parts on the internet and it, it blew up, but I, I can remember making that jump though. If you go from the sure thing of a paycheck to the uncertainty of making it yourself, that's a that's a big leap for a lot of people to make that move and leverage all those yeah. resources that you can to pull that off for sure. But yeah, it's you know it's a passion like you talk about. I mean, you couldn't stop writing if somebody asked you to. We couldn't stop creating art and you know um, media like this if someone asked us to. It's just it's innate in us and it just has to come out and you're, you're going to do it no matter what. So you can try to yeah. stop it with other distractions, but it's just ultimately not going to happen. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I actually think that's the key to my success is people, you know, cause people ask me that a lot. They're like, well, you know, how did, how were you able to make it last for 30 plus years? Blah, 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 blah. And I just say, well, I, a, I didn't have a backup plan. So I, I, you know, I worked my ass off to, to make it happen, but the passion and the genuine uh, love of the genre and what I was doing made those horrifically long work weeks. Um, you know, with, with very, very little financial return that, you know, it made them not just bearable, but I, I was enjoying what I was doing. You know, um, you had bad days kind of scattered in there, of course, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was just a genuine love for it. And that's, that's what people tell me after the fact, because, you know, now uh, 10, 15 years into it, I was kind of able to go to some people and say, Hey, what, what made you work with me in the beginning? Cause you know, if tables were turned, I don't know if I would have worked with myself and they're just like, well, it was obvious you weren't doing it because, you know, because you wanted to have your name on the front of a magazine or publish your own stories or do this or do that. You know, you were just doing it because you really love the field. And, um, you know, that genuine passion from someone that age was hard to find. So I think that shines through. And I think that's what ultimately will will get people to jump on board with you. That's um, I, I I make the joke with some of our guests, you know, what uh, thank you for, for coming on to such a small, I mean, we're just starting out, you know, we, uh, when Brian Keene agreed to come on, we had 10 su subscribers on our YouTube channel. Um, and now we're up to 130 something. Um, you know, we've only done 20 something shows, but um, it's, you know, I ask people, you know, why, why us, you know, and some of them just mentioned the passion. You know, they can see it when, when we're talking and, and, um, and just you know chatting with people talking about our, our work and so forth so um it's it's just there you know joel and i um are up till one two in the morning working on stuff texting each other so um our families probably pay for it um i'm sure i'm not the, the happiest guy in the morning when i wake up at 6 a.m <laughs> but <laughs> um, at least you get up though I, you know i get up that yeah. early oh my god i'm a mess yeah <laughs> same here I, i'm I have, up but i'm not up if you know what i mean I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah my my seven-year-old can can take care of himself although you know i'll find him on youtube in the morning at 7 a.m watching siren head videos i don't know if you guys have heard <laughs> of this youtube i don't even i was like what is siren head and it's this giant like <laughs> telephone pole monster or something like <laughs> that like attacks cities and i'm like he's having nightmares about this i'm like you gotta like we're blocking this like you need to stop but you're watching <laughs> this, this at 7 a.m but my three-year-old doesn't let that happen she she comes into our room 6 a.m you hear little footsteps and i'm like oh <laughs> i feel like i just went to bed um but, yeah my yeah. kids Sorry about that. around it surrounded by uh, i i like hearing stories now from my oldest son because he he's a writer and a, and a filmmaker so he does some of these things with me and i've done some signings with him and some appearances and i hear him talking about when he was little and he used to he has to turn you know he had to turn there were a bookcase in the hallway of our old house so when he left his bedroom to go down to the bathroom or walk down the steps he had to pass these books and he would you know some of them were face out and he's like well, and there's the one i always had to turn the cover around and then two days later it would be turned back the other way and you know, he's like uh, you know so no wonder i had nightmares 
That's hilarious. Yeah, you were going, you're just walking down the hallway, like, why is my book moved? <laughs> <You're> fixing it. <laughs> well, that's, oh, that's a real problem now because, like, I'm drawing and my kids want to see what I'm drawing. And they're like, I'm like, I don't really think you should be seeing this, but they're, they're yeah, very interested exactly. in what I'm doing. And I'm trying to, like, blow it up so it's huge on my tab so they can't really see the whole image, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. That's funny. But yeah, then they get, they get curious and, I guess they'll handle. It. Hopefully, I don't make them into some strange adult when they get older. From my yeah, my it'll be all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was yeah. going to ask actually. You mentioned your son; he's a writer now. Um, he he published his first book, right? Um, in the last couple of years. Um, he published uh, Widow's Point with me. We did a yeah. novella together, and then they turned that into a film. But uh, yeah, he's uh, he's finished. Um, sorry about that. Someone someone just texted me the. Uh, no worries. The Red Sox score. So, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, Seven to one, uh, sir. <laughs> yeah. <Houston. laughs> um, so yeah, he he uh, he actually has finished his first novel, and and I'm actually doing a second uh, read of it right now, and he's working on a, a short story collection of stories that are kind of interconnected. So yeah, he's busy. He's doing some cool stuff, and uh, yeah, he's a very different, much better writer at age 22 than I was. You know, I was writing like. <laughs> I was writing like, you know, stories about like little monsters that came out of, you know, stale beer, bot, you know, <laughs> bottles and, and, and attacked, uh, you know, a, uh, an abusive husband, those kind of things. And he's, you know, he's writing this very lyrical prose that's deep and quoting Johnny Cash. And I'm like, where in the hell is this coming from? You know, but good for him. You know, it's uh, I look back yeah. at what I 22 and I cringe. Well, he can learn from some of your mistakes too, right? So that's, uh, yeah. he's got that going for him. That's huge. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and he has, I mean, he's heard, he's heard all of our, you know, he's heard all of our stories about, you know, creating a business and, and, you know, finding a $10 bill in your car and it being like a major event that week and <laughs> those kind of things. So yeah, he, he knows. Yeah. I, I think, um, I think a lot of people would pay to read about uh, monsters coming out of beer bottles uh, to attack. Well, I, they can read one of my early <laughs> stories. It's in one of the collections. That I, it's in a collection I did of all early stories that had a very small print run for for a reason. Um, oh man, I got to look that up. Uh, yeah, Thunderstorm <laughs> Books did it. I'm trying. I think it's called The Vault. It's all okay. early stuff. It's uh, K K Brian Keene actually did the intro, I think, and and I did an afterward and and. Yeah, there's stories that I didn't put in any of the other, you know, regular collections. Um, and there's, you know, there's a theme to them in that, you know, they are very much, uh, you know, um, not not like the good comic book stories that you guys are writing, but like the old fashioned, really one note comic book stories that, you know, that were uh, popular way back when. And, uh, you know, there's like one twist and there's, you know, there's one note to the story. And that's what these pro stories are like. I'd probably love it being an EC Comics guy. That was just you know, boom. Like, yeah, you know what? You might. Right? You might. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Oh man. Yeah, I guess you know, I meant I saw some other interviews too, where you're uh, you're a big fan of the uh, like the Twilight Zone stuff too, right? Old black and white that show and things. So they're kind of like that too, where they have like the one kind of that big plot twist at the end. That's that's it. So. Maybe yeah, yeah, over. and a lot of those things I didn't even. There, a lot of those stories that I that I of mine that that fall into that kind of category. You know, they, I didn't even do them on purpose like that. They just it's just how they turned out. So I think it was that subconscious of you know yeah. those all that Twilight Zone that I uh, you know that I watched and read as 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 a young guy. I, I thank God that I had a brother that was, he, he's about your age. So he took me under his wing. So I got to be exposed to all this stuff that I think most people my age wouldn't have otherwise. So it was great that I got to have all that stuff, you know, the outer limits, twilight zone, all that stuff. So thankful for that. So that's somewhere in there now. So it's good. Yeah. I was the youngest of five, you know, with an old, the yeah. oldest, you know, an older brother and three older sisters. And so, yeah, like my brother was responsible for like, introducing me to like the uh the old Abbott and costello meets the mummy and you know dracula and frankenstein and all those um and then i had my sisters on the other hand and they kind of they they turned me on to more things like uh you know what is it like mommy dearest and some of those just kind of you know mainstream the birds from alfred hitchcock and, yeah. and all that um and, and, you know, they made me watch things like The Wizard of Oz and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, which I always, you know, I keyed in on the scary stuff, the flying monkeys and the the child oh, yeah. napping and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang with the big net, um, who I, I had nightmares about for like three years, I think. But <laughs> my favorite part of the movie, and I watched it every time I could. Yeah. yeah. 
I was a big fan of uh, the Ray Bradbury Theater, too. I think I've seen every one, so my mm-hmm. brother dragged me through that, but I loved it, too. So, and now they're back out on YouTube, so you can watch them all on YouTube now. And those are fabulous. Yeah, I have be nice. It'd be nice to see somebody like kind of relaunch that series. I mean, be hard, obviously for him to do. Well, it, it, technically impossible for him to do the intro unless they reused it. But um, you know, it'd be so cool to see them kind of delve back into that. Maybe touch on some of his other stories and bring it back out. I think that would be a great time to do that, especially on some of these alt small subscription networks. Maybe too could put something. Yeah, I agree. Like that. Yeah, they could actually get some. They could actually get a great collection of uh, of writers and directors and, and artists to, to do the introductions. Oh yeah, you know people people would love to be attached to something like that. Absolutely, so much passion behind that. People are so enthusiastic about them. I bet you people would you know, volunteer almost to do it just so they could be on that project. It's it's great. I mean, I would I would sure. love to do something. I would. Stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> Sign us up. <laughs> we got two. We'll start a consortium. Yeah. We'll go for it. Yep. Um, talking yeah. about. You know, um, screenplays and things. One thing I wanted to ask is, you know, you take, I know you've done some screenplay work, taking, you know, huge novels that are, you know, 700, uh, 1200 pages long. How challenging is that to kind of condense that into a screenplay? What does that process look like for you? And, uh, oh, it's small. How can that be? <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> I figured, I, mean, I was like, how is this possible? <laughs> the the yeah. biggest example I can give you is we did, uh, my buddy John Shrek and I, who I grew up with, um, we did uh, Black House by Stephen King and Peter Straub. Um, yeah. So you are talking about, uh, I can see a copy over there and it's like the, uh, it's like a brick. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was the toughest. And, and <clears throat> it ended up being the screenplay that we were the most proud that we, you know, we hit that 100, that magic 120 page mark that they all want. Um, which drove me crazy because I'm like, you know, the only people who have to listen to this are the people who aren't successful enough to kind of make their own rules. You know, nobody told Frank Darabont that he had to turn in, you know, Shaw, well, Shawshank, they probably did cause he was a, you know, a rookie, but you know, Green Mile sure as hell wasn't a 120 page, you know, screenplay right. and, and so many other examples of that. And I understand that. And John would always come back and say, well, we're, we're not successful screenwriters yet. And I'm like, but it's still, it doesn't matter. You know, the story is what's important. So because we're not, we have to turn in this 120 pages instead of 140. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, the process there was read the book, Lots of post-it notes, um, lots of uh, highlight, you know, the sections. Um, and, you you know, I kept a notebook and I'm just like, this is what has to be in. This is what is kind of on the fence. It can go either way. And these are the things that we have to cut. And then, you you know, then you just get to writing. And, uh, you know, what I found out is it's not as much fun as I thought it'd be, <laughs> which is why I don't <laughs> do it as often now. Um my agent always asked my dad, do you want, you know, with a new property, do you want to, you know, you want to be involved in the film? And I said, you know, the only involvement I want is just to cash the check when they send it to us. Um, <laughs> you know, and there may be a book that I changed my mind about that, you know, something that is so important to me that I changed my mind. But even with Boogeyman, I'm like, which is about me. I'm like, no, they can do it. They can write it. And, you know, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a tough thing. Uh, I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I jumped in kind of by accident. I saw my buddy, he, he was out in Hollywood, you know, being a big actor. And I saw him once when he came home and we started talking about stories and he's like, we should make a short film of one of yours. And uh, so we did, he, he picked a story of mine called heroes. It's kind of a father and son story. Um, and it's kind of a Dracula turn on eternal life. And uh, he, he fell in love with the story. So he, uh, you know, he, he got, he was married to Christine Applegate at the time. So Christine is in it. Uh, Jaiman Hansu, who was in Gladiator and Amistad and all these other big movies. He, you know, he's our mystery man. And so we did this little short film over two nights in Los Angeles and um, had fun with it. So then that's what we kind of decided to start writing together. And we did a Masters of Horror and we did a couple episodes of uh, Fear Itself. And oh, uh, cool. we did like a half dozen um, you know, full lengths. And we had a couple of them that were produced. And then, you know, the best stuff we wrote, uh, Black House, uh, it didn't get made. You know, we wrote that for Akiva Goldman, who's like won a bunch of Academy Awards and he loved it. But it, that was back when Talisman was all tied up in all that, you know, red tape with Spielberg. And so we ended up, you know, being stuck and it couldn't get made where nowadays it probably could get made. But right. yeah, the best stuff we wrote, you know, is, is still there on paper. Who, who would star you in Chasing the Boogeyman? You know what? A lot of people have asked me that, and I'm like, I'm taking the cop out answer and saying my my son Billy because he's 22. Everyone said he's my age at the time of the book. 
Um, everyone says he looks exactly like I did, which isn't necessarily true, but I guess it's close enough because I don't know who the hell else I'd pick. I'm like, I lose no matter who I, I lose no matter who I pick. So, uh, and plus I don't know half their names, but yeah, someone who gotcha. can, you know, uh, I pick my son for looks and then just someone who can kind of pull off that, that, that struggle between trying to be a good human being and also, you know, uh, you can't help but, like you said, drive by the uh, the memorials and, you know, sticking yeah. your nose a little bit deeper in than it should be. I think John had a technical issue. He dropped off. He might come back on here. So that's okay. Oh, yeah. That's life challenges. Yeah. So we're coming up on Halloween. So I wanted to add, you know, I got a horror thriller author on. I want to ask you, what's a time that you were personally the most scared in your life? If you had a story behind that and what, what happened in that point for you? Oh, um. You know, just going kind of for those visceral scares, like the kind of, you know, that we're talking about things that go bump in the night, shadows that move that shouldn't move, those kind of things. Because right. there's other times where you're scared because, you know, you the health of a loved one or something like that, you know, yeah, and, gotcha. and you a period of uncertainty. And that's no fun to answer or even think about. But um, probably when I was young, you know, when we was I was the kid who always I love to be scared. Um, so and I'm and I'm a believer. I still am. I mean, I I tell the story all the time, but I'm like, you know. Billy and I, we started the first paranormal activity movie. We started watching that one night, like 10 o'clock at night, opposite ends of the sofa, you know, like a half an hour in, we're sitting right next to each other under the same blanket, like another half an hour in, we're like, let's turn this off and finish tomorrow in the sunlight. Um, Cause I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer, you know? Um, so yeah, it was probably one of those times when I was younger and I, you, my friends and, you know, we were all out at night trying to scare each other. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, we used to, I wrote about it in boogeyman, you know, we used to walk up this long dra gravel driveway by this house called the Myers house. And we, I'd be telling stories or we'd be like, do you hear that? You know? And one, yeah, half the time we'd end up screaming and flying home as fast as we could. And then we'd do the same thing stupid thing the next night but yeah that's that's yeah. exactly that's exactly probably you know one of those times is when i was the most scared yeah i've grown up in some pretty old messed up houses this house is 1850 i have old farmhouses and my father was a minister so we always lived in the old parsonages that came with the 300 year old new england church and man oh man i've had some things that happen that are just unexplained that are in the house and you know to your point there's things that move that shouldn't move or noises that are yeah. made that just is not a house making a normal house settling noise. <laughs> just Absolutely. Maybe, maybe it's my imagination as a young guy at that point, but, um, man, there was just some, just some things that still, um, you know, people don't jingle keys outside of a door in the middle of the night that aren't there when you open the door. I mean, house doesn't right. make that sound, <laughs> you know, uh, they don't walk up and down the hallway. Um, all night long, you know, the house doesn't make that sound. So there's, there's things like that, that really, um, you got me going, you know, and probably the most, uh, haunted house I ever stayed in was in my, um, my aunt's house was like that. And things would happen like radios would turn on with no batteries that are unplugged and, um, something would take a shower and, uh, drain the tub and uh, they'd find the door locked and then they go to touch it again and it's unlocked and the you know, tub's draining out and nobody's in there and yeah. the bath water's warm, things like that. So is it, no. uh, I don't know how you, how do you explain that away? Right. So people that don't believe like, go ahead and explain that away. <laughs> so, yeah. Know. No, I mean, they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll just say you did it yourself or something, but no, we live, uh, I mean, I'm in my home office right now, which is only this part of it is only like 15 years old. We moved here like three years ago, but the, the main part of the house where we live, it was built in the early, I'm trying to think, I think like uh, early 1800s, 1810, something like that. But the, the other part of the house was 1780. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, it's big time old. And the basement is still the full lumber trees, you yep. know, uh, Same here. Yep. support and, and, you know, original hardwoods throughout, you know, most of it. And uh, yeah, when we moved in here, we, we knew we were, it was very old fashioned. I mean, it's a beautiful house, but it was very old fashioned. So we knew we were going to have to kind of redo the entire inside and, and, you know, maintain, maintain yeah. the integrity of it. And, um, before we did, you know, we knew we had, I'm trying to think, I think we had like 15 days before they were going to start work. And my son and I were like, we have to make a film here. So we did, we ended up making this short film called murder house that, that oh, is nice. in our house. And, uh, yeah, it's actually going to come out on DVD in like three weeks. So, uh, Oh no kidding. That's awesome. Everyone could see the inside of our house, but we, we just did it for fun. And, uh, yeah. we literally, like I said, we had two weeks. So I, I wrote the script the next night 
um, talked to this local production company who, who had been wanting to do something with us for a while. And they're like, yeah, you know, we can, what are you thinking? You know, well, six weeks. And we're like, no, we, we, we have two weeks. So we shot it two long nights <laughs> before my son went back to, uh, to school. And, uh, like I said, we had a blast and, uh, we kind of have this memento of our house before we upgraded everything now. But, uh, that's yeah, cool. people, people kept asking me, you sure you want to do a film in your own house called Murder House? <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? I mean, uh, I've always had like weird death things chase me. Like I have a cemetery on my property that has at least 12 oh. graves in it. Um, my other house was a former funeral home and none of this was intentional. So there's something in the universe that ties me to the afterlife somehow all the time. So I don't know, but it's kind of fun. So mm. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah. But there's yeah. the old uh, farm family plot here that I guess the people that originally lived here are buried right over there. So it's kind of yeah, there's, no, there's no way your there's no way your house isn't haunted. Yeah, it's, I haven't it's seen a, anything. I don't know. This one's pretty quiet. <laughs> I've had yeah. some I've had some messed up ones, but this one's pretty quiet. So. Yeah. Would be great this if we like old... stuff, stuff moving by him right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, live in, 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 the, in the summer, he uh, he does the show out on his uh, three season porch, and it just gets pitch black behind him. It's just woods. And I, I've said that I want to hire someone to just sneak up behind him at the screen door and just scare the crap out of him while we're live on the air. But um, it'll happen next summer, probably. But you won't see it coming. Um, <laughs> yeah. but and then it'll be, I, like, first of all, it'll be like the night before you hired someone to do it, and something will happen. And you'll be like, it wasn't me. Yeah, yeah, right? That's how movies start right there. I swear it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't what I set up. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I yeah, apologize. I'm on my something. phone now. Um, I'm on my phone now because, uh, I don't know if you have Comcast in Maryland, Rich, but they're pretty brutal. Yeah, we do. Um, oh yeah. So it just shot out. It, like it's only happened in two shows for me, but in the two shows I anticipated probably the most. So I'm like, you have to be freaking kidding me right now. Uh, <laughs> so, uh we've had, uh, I've had that with a couple, uh, couple shows I've done where it's thunderstorming outside and I'm just like, I could be gone at any minute. And sure enough. Yeah. I, I'm boom. I'm gone. Yeah, shoot out. And um, you're still in Maryland, I wanted right, to... you're, you're in Maryland? I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was in uh, Towson um, probably about 10 years ago, and I got 21 inches of snow, and it shut the state oh. down. So that's a rarity for Towson. So, yeah. What, what, what were you there for, a show? Or... Yeah, or the, the band was playing out. at the Rector, Rector Theater there in Towson. Um, it was oh, a okay. reunion show, and we flew down to see him, a band called Nothing Face, metal band down there and. um yeah, that was a good time, but we stayed. We were going to get out of there, then the snow came, and we got stuck for like two more days. But it's, I, it's yeah. the first time I've ever seen thunder and lightning in a snowstorm. We don't have that happen up here, but that was wild. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm that. hoping we get some good snow this year. We got crap for snow last year. Where are you guys at again? We're in New Hampshire. Uh, so you get yeah. plenty of snow. Yeah, you Tons don't. You don't. We'll, yeah. send <laughs> we'll send it down. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh. John, hey, back up. hey um, oh, you're back on. You're I'm double, trying to come back camera. on the computer here. Yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to get off my phone here. All right. All right. There you, there you go. There All right, go. that's so much better. My arm was getting tired. Why? <laughs> Sorry, guys. So how close this, are you guys? Are? You... Oh. <laughs> oh, we live about 45 minutes. Okay, that's yeah, right. There we, that. there we go. Jeez. Sorry. That's, that's what you get that with us. Who's what? Somebody else popped on down there, but I guess it was you too. It was you, two of me. Yeah. <laughs> I had his phone yeah. and a, it, no, and his, uh, I, I could not. I couldn't wait for my computer to start back up. My arm was getting tired. I'm sitting there like this, the the last 15 minutes. So, uh, anyways, I thought, something, I thought something happened in the Red Sox game, and you were like, "I'm going." Oh, they lost. Oh, they horribly lost. Uh, nine they already one, lost. So it was nine to one. Very much so. Yeah, nine to one. Yeah. I know yeah, several so. people who were there tonight who uh, I expect to. I expect to get texts anytime now with lots yeah. of bad words. Yeah. yeah. A couple of my I, I close gonna, friends were there. I was going to, kind of good segue. I was going to ask you, um, I heard one of the other interviews that used to play baseball. What position did you play when you were playing? I played when I was younger, like right up until like 10th grade in high school. And then I switched over to lacrosse. Um, so yeah, I played, what did I play? Mostly third base. Um, okay. Played a little, played a little second, but yeah, no, I grew up like, you know, my, my dream was like, I just want to be center fielder for the Baltimore Orioles and everything will be right with the world. But uh, yeah, yeah, that, that changed over to, I played, I guess I played from like, you know, time I was like five to to 15 or 16. And I just, you know, it was the perfect time for the lacrosse coach to kind of come in and suck me over because I was getting bored of it. 
Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a lifelong baseball fan for sure. Yeah, John awesome. and I too, which was kind of odd. And John can tell you, we started, uh, John was writing a baseball horror story. And I kind of suggested that we should write a baseball horror story. I had no idea he was. So that's how <laughs> tune we are with each other. So but John can tell you a little bit about that too. It's funny how that happened. Yeah. 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 I, I just, um, I was thinking, you don't see many horror stories, if any, take place, you know, w- with a baseball character being the main character. And like, we both are diehard baseball fans. So I started just coming up with ideas and I was writing like a rough outline and I, I did not say a word to Joel about it. And he, he came to me, he's like, Hey, I, I want to do a baseball story called dead ball and just have it take place during the dead ball era. And, uh, <laughs> I was like, are you serious? Um, my story wasn't during that era, but I, I was like, I'm actually writing a baseball story. So if we uh, we talked about it. We kind of mixed our two ideas together and uh, got our next comic series coming out. So oh, that's um, awesome. yeah, it was it was yeah. really cool. And our other co-host that's not here tonight, he he's illustrating it. Joel's coloring it. I'm writing it. So it's uh, oh, I need uh, to we're see pretty that. Excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I. Uh, I uh, Back in the nine, back probably back in the first half of the nineties, um, before you guys were born, I uh, I was absolutely. It was back when the anthologies were just, you know, so many different anthologies were out there, horror anthologies with different themes. I mean, it, it, anything you can think of, it, it was there. And for a while, I thought about doing a, a baseball or a sports related one, and, and I found out very quickly that uh, there's not as many uh, sports fans who are, uh, you know, genre guys as as i had wished um which is one yeah. of the reasons i was with stephen king i think he could probably say the same thing you know it's like lots of lots of friends around town who who you can talk baseball with but then you get together with other writers and and it, there were you know there was an awful lot of them who were like sports i you know i, I don't follow sports i've never followed sports <laughs> yeah so, yeah you know, that was brian brian keen told us he's like i don't i don't i don't watch sports but uh but yeah, I mean Stephen King. He's he's probably more of a Red Sox fan than we are. He's he's diehard, and he wrote a book about <laughs> about Tom Gordon, a Red Sox reliever. You know, it's, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah and he did the faithful nonfiction book, and yeah, no, he's he's big time fan, and as yeah. is his family. And yeah, I always love when it's uh, around uh, Super Bowl time when Keen starts tweeting about you know the Super Bowl, and <laughs> you know I have no idea who's playing. I have no idea what the rules are. I'm you know, yeah, he's funny. Yeah. And there's more there's yeah. more Brian Keens than Stephen Kings out there, that's for sure. When it yeah. comes to being sports fans. We find that in the comic yeah. world too. It's like, oh, I like comic books, I don't like sports. But then occasionally you find some people that are really into both. And that's kind of cool when we connect with that. And what we do in our stories, we try to do a lot of cross genre things like that. Like we want to bring in, you know, we do a uh, Yule's a Christmas based story that's a horror story. So if you're into Christmas, you got horror. So we're trying to bring in different genres that maybe somebody who likes one but doesn't it's not familiar with the other and kind of mix and match. And it's kind of been our, our theme unintentionally, I guess. So kind yeah. of is the comic book world a mess as far as distribution, the way it has been, is uh, it still a yeah, mess? It's, it's tough yeah. because I mean, you got some big players, you know, a uh, diamond uh, penguin, those guys, but even some of them are starting to get picky about who they're carrying. Like, what was it, John? If some were cutting like DC or Marvel, they're cutting some big names. Yeah, there. well, Diamond was going through a bunch of financial issues, and they cut. It, you know, um, DC, I believe, isn't going through them anymore, and um, which opens up opportunity because now they're going to take on more indie companies, um, more than likely. But, but yeah, it's it's been a mess there. Um, but because like uh, we, I was, was going to say, like ten years into publishing Cemetery Dance. There was, you know, I was carried through, uh, you know, Ingram and, and the big distributors for like the new store for the the, the newsstands and the uh, bookstores. But the mm-hmm. comics world then was pretty cool because it, you had Diamond, which is local to me in Baltimore. Um, and you had Capital City and you had a whole bunch of small ones like Ubiquities and, and, and a bunch of, uh, you know, regional distributors. And uh, the nice thing about comic distributors for us was unlike Ingram and the bookstores is, you know, the comics, uh, the distributors, you know, they were non-returnable. They didn't send it back and mm-hmm. they took big discounts. But but then what happened back then, and I, you guys probably know this, is Diamond kind of bought everybody up um, yeah. and everything went through them. And then they did become more, you know, uh, pickier about what they listed in their catalogs and, and all that. So we finally just gave up on them and, and just stuck with the newsstand distributors. But I just remember for a while there, it was like gravy days because you had a lot of different comic distributors who would uh, put you in different places and they paid their bills, you know, which was nice. You're starting to see a lot more 
uh, startup distributors out there. Um, there's a few in the indie industry that um, hopefully they take off, you know, and that gives people more avenues to explore, to, to get their books on shelves. Um, with us, I mean, we, because we still have day jobs. I mean, we're, we're only on our second book. Um, we have a lot in the pipeline that we're very excited about, but we don't even want to approach stores yet until we have a backlog basically. So we can, you right. know, basically, um, you know, Joel, is sitting there drawing a book that's going to take a couple months because we have day jobs that we want to make sure we have something to, to give the stores every month so that we can stay ahead of it. So, um, yeah. but so that's, that's where we're at now. I mean, we're, we're, um, we have selling our own website and, you know, we have talked to a lot of local shops. Um, a lot of the local shops, they, they will take indie books on, but they, don't have a no return policy like they it, for right. them to take the risk they want you to say hey I'll, I'll you know you can give me the books back if they don't sell by x date you know so right. but at least you at least you get them back you know the, my new stand yeah. distributors they would just rip the covers off and send those and that's oh, you know oh, yeah. you have, or they did it by affidavit and you have to trust them yeah man yeah, the, the indie world's becoming more and more popular, though. It's just the self-publishing. I mean, it's easy now. You can do a print run of 10 books, right? And it's nothing. It's right. cost-effective. You can do it. I mean, it's incredible. So the, I don't think it's ever been as popular. There's a lot of political stuff going on in the major publishing, you know, the big-name world. Um, they're getting rid of some of their key artists because of that stuff. Maybe something they said in the past that was questionable, and they end up having to get rid of them because of the cancel culture or whatever. Right, um, right. So a lot of those guys are going into indie stuff too because there's things they want to do artistically or say that may be you know, on the fringe. You know, It could be a, a good story, but it might accidentally offend some people. But should that story be told? Maybe it should, right? right? I mean, yeah. so it's kind of a balancing act, but they cannot do that on their current platform. So uh, the indie yeah, world is getting... More popular. I was going to say, that's what indies, you know, that, that, that's kind of the purpose is, is another voice and another arena to kind of tell the stories. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's the exciting thing. I, that's what I've always said about Cemetery Dance, at least, is just, you know, it, it's not like New York publishing because there is no big committee. You know, it's me and a couple other guys making the decisions. So that's that. Yeah. You know, and now it's you two. So that's cool. And those are the <laughs> yeah. things I like reading the most is the things that are smaller people. That's like, these are the things that I don't want to have completely, you know, uh, pasteurized and put through some filter. I want to read raw. I want to be offended. Uh, you know, I'm in my mid forties. Defend me at this point is kind of hard to do. So, so please, if you can offend me, like, let's, let's hear it. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> yeah. You were born in the <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I was, I was born in the I was born in the eighties too. Uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 younger. I'm 25 in here though, Richard. I'm yeah. always well, I'm well, I'm like 14 in here. But, so uh, I, I still <laughs> I still you know my my son is trying to talk me out of jumping the bonfire on the mini bike because I tell him I'm doing it. I'm doing it Halloween night. We're having a bonfire. And I'm like I am jumping that bastard on the mini bike. Like, <laughs> Are you serious? I'm, I, so I, you're doing the you're doing these 31 days of horror uh, 31 days uh, on YouTube. I want to put the video up. Oh, okay, I was gonna say. Up. I'm like, look, he's like, you're gonna you're gonna burst into a flame. It has gas. I'm like, I'm going to fly through it. He, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he's funny. He's a warrior. I'm like, you can like coat me in Vaseline so I won't be flammable, flammable or something. And we'll have a we'll have a uh, fire extinguisher. He's just like, no, I'm not I'm not <laughs> doing it. I'm like, well, you're not. I don't need a I don't need a you know financial sponsor for the jump. So yeah, we have, we have an ongoing argument. So yeah, I may or may not die on Halloween night, but uh, I'm pretty committed. Yeah, it's going to be it. a night to go. I mean, that's it, <laughs> right on. Yeah, <laughs> you might want to you might want to stream that live on Twitter so that you know we get to see it regardless, right? Um, yeah, I, you know. I could probably sell advertising for that. So <laughs> pay per view <laughs> event. <laughs> this is something your old horror, you know, writer. But yeah, no, I, I'm still very much a, a, a dumb kid in in my heart. That's for sure. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a, don't, don't lose that. That's a that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What what are some of your most uh, fondest Halloween memories? I think you talked a little bit about it in chasing the boogeyman. But what are some of the things that you know? What's a good memory for you for back in those days when you were out doing the kid thing? Yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, it was just all. It really every Halloween. You know, I hate to say it, but every in a good way, every Halloween was the same, and that was just you know. You grab a pillowcase, you put on your costume and you just you're I mean, back then it, there were no there were no, you know, uh, neighborhood rules of, you know, you have to stop trick or treating at eight o'clock or anything like that. So we were as soon as the sun was down, we were gone. And it was, you know, three and four hour marathon jaunts 
hitting as many houses as you could and, you know, and spreading rumors. So, and so is giving out full chocolate bars and da, 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 and, <laughs> and, you know, scaring other trick or treaters and the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, it was very Ray Bradbury. -ish. You know, we didn't have, yeah. uh, although I did find out recently that the Myers house in, in that's featured in chasing the boogeyman, some of the kids were holding out on us because it was the neighborhood haunted house and none of us ever thought of going there trick or treating, but evidently they did give out like full size candy bars oh, nice. and people kept that to themselves. And, and for years, I just found this out at a book. <laughs> oh, man. I missed out. Um, but yeah. And then as we got older and we had kids, you know, like right now my sons are 22 and 20 and I mean, 22 and 18. And um, the one graduated from college last year and he's at home. And then the other one just just left for college. Um, but when they were younger, we we always so just like in Chasing the Boogeyman, we had, you know, big pot of spaghetti, a bunch of food and everyone came to our house. So, hmm. you know, a lot of the adults stayed behind. And if there was a college game football or, you know, they'd all be congregated around the television or playing pool or something. But there was usually like a half dozen dads that went you know, with the kids trick or treating and we had a blast and my kids still say, you know, somebody will be like, you know, who the hell eats candy corn? And they're like, you know, we would get two big bags every year and the dads would fill their pockets with them. And any car that came through the neighborhood driving too fast would just, you, it would, it would be just like a hail of bullets <laughs> because all the dads would just nail it. And we, and we'd like, we dare you to stop now, you know, flying down. The um, and we would crawl out on the roof and scare you know, of our house, the, the overhang, and we would scare kids who came up to the porch. And we did that for like three or four years. And then we stopped because we made a couple kids cry. And my wife oh. was like, you, know, you can't do this anymore. And we're like, well, we don't want them to cry. But they're like, you have a scream mask on and, and, a, and a black outfit. So all they see is this, you know, this luminous yeah. face, you know, hanging above them. Um, but yeah, Halloween's always a big, a, a good time. Um, and now we, you know, we kind of live a little bit off the beaten track, so we don't have trick or treaters. And it's probably yeah, the same only here. negative about living where we live is, is, uh, you know, they, they're in a neighborhood that's across the street aways. And I'm just like, but maybe if we line our porch with big jack-o'-lanterns, you know, and they're all glowing, people will come. So yeah. Yeah, Halloween yeah. Is, is pretty sacred around here. We, awesome. um, I grew up in a small town where we had to drive to trick or treat. We couldn't, there was no neighborhood. I lived out on a dirt road with, with a campground next to me and that was it. Um, but, but yeah, we live in a nice neighborhood now, but my, my son who's seven, uh, part of what made me want to, you know, kick me into, to writing, um, the story that ended up being the Yule comic was he loves scary stories. He loves me reading goosebumps to him. And, um, he likes Halloween more than Christmas right now. He last year when he was six, he only wanted to trick or treat for one side of the street. And he's like, I want to go back to hand candy out because I want to scare people. He, he was he had this <laughs> big skeleton mask and he, he has oh, all these oh. animatronics around our yard. That's what he wants for Christmas is a $200 animatronic uh, zombie. And uh, so on Christmas, we're sick. I have a crypt keeper like that. He's full size. Oh, no and kidding. I, it turns and it says something. And yeah, we've had that forever. I need to, like lug it for, it's in my work office i need to bring it home actually oh awesome. man yeah, no, your kid sounds awesome and he sounds very much like uh like mine did at that age so you you may be in for it <laughs> oh boy i i'm already in for it yeah he so the last when we came back to hand candy out he decided to sit in a chair with the candy bowl in his lap and just <laughs> freeze he was know, frozen cool. and the first person that came up, he, he was too embarrassed. He just sat there and someone grabbed candy. They walked away. Didn't even know he was a person. The next person was, was uh, like, uh, this older lady was there with like her grandkid and he just jumps up and this lady screams at the top of her lungs. And my son just sits back down and doesn't say a word. And I'm like, the, the lady left and I was, I was dying. I'm like, he looked over and he's like, give me a thumbs up. <laughs> See, he would have been right at home with us up on the roof. <laughs> exactly. That would, that's what reminded me of that. When you said that story, I'm like, my son would have been like, can I go up there? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. what happened. Usually at, at the beginning, it was just me and one of my buddies. And then it turned into, you know, me and both of my sons and the, you know, the, the, yeah, their mom was not happy with them, you know, 30 feet above the ground, you know, <laughs> yeah. leaning over to scare kids. And, and the tears were the final straw that, that broke that tradition. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we're coming up yeah. on an hour, uh, Richard, already, believe it or not. Um, what do you got in the pipeline? What's coming up for you or Cemetery Dance that you want to talk about? Or, um, um, tons of books with CD. Uh, the, the big thing for me, I've got Gwendy's uh, Final Task, the, the third book in the uh, nice. Gwendy uh, Peterson trilogy, and that's coming out in February. Um, 
we just released the paperback cover last night and and yeah it was kind of a nice buzz online because it's uh you could you could see the clear connection to the dark tower and so all, all the king's dark tower fans are, are going nuts and which is a good thing hopefully they'll all buy the book and you know <laughs> a, a whole bunch of them posted you know I never bothered with these books. Now I'm going to have to. And I'm just like on the other end of my phone going, yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, anyone books. watching, those books are great. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, I, I have them. to buy three instead of one. Right? So, yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can't so That's, that that's the big thing that's coming. And then Boogeyman will be out in paperback, I think, in uh, June. So I know they're going to put a lot behind that. So, yeah, it's a, it'll next year will be an exciting year. And uh about yeah. to start working on the next book, which I think is going to be the sequel to Boogeyman. It may be a, a standalone instead, and I'll do the sequel after that. But I, I really am itching to to work on the sequel. So I think that's nice. what's going to come next. Yeah. Awesome. Um, that's great. When, when we had Keen on, um, I tried to pry a little info out of him. He didn't give too much, but he talked to, because you guys are all over Twitter, you know, give, dropping these hints about this project of in, in Castle Rock. Um, oh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm probably pointless to even ask, but uh, any any update on that? Um, he, he... No, just that he's you know he's doing the scripting, and um, I cannot remember her name, but a very cool artist it, it has worked up a bunch of uh, you know preliminary stuff, and then uh, you know we're gonna work with. I'm probably giving more than he did, but we're gonna work with. Uh, uh, um, I know I know his name. I'm just not sure how to pronounce it. Chris Rael is that his name? He used yeah, to I think that's how you say it. Yeah. 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 Who's, who's worked with Joe Hill a lot and he's worked with Steve a few times. So we put together a good team and we're going to, you know, either do it through Chris's new company or we may even just do it completely independently. But uh, yeah, you know, I, uh, I know Brian's a big King fan and he's, and he's a hell of a writer. So I, I was happy to, to ask him to do that. And, and so was yeah. Steve. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're on a really loose timetable because everybody involved is really busy, but I do think it's something that, that will probably come to fruition next year. That's yeah. I, well, you three are three of my favorites. So just hearing that there's like some project involving the, you know, the three of you um, in story, I, I, I don't even know the specifics, but um, that got me excited. So um, well, when, when we can talk about it a little bit more, we can, Brian and I can both come back and we'll, We'll do the show and that'd be, and sweet. Yeah. be, yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Brian and I have yeah. fun together. So. Yeah. Right. yeah, we know each other's secrets, so it's always a good time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's great. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get the to, to scares that care uh, next year. Are you are you gonna be at that or um you know you what? Know? I, I have an invite and I am waiting for some scheduling stuff before I can say yes. Um, I'd yeah. like to. I was I was I was, you know, signed up to go two years previous and then the one year I had really good legit reasons and I don't remember. I know one was because I had to go uh, on an unexpected college visit with, with one of my sons and it couldn't be missed. Um, and I don't know what the other one was, but it was something equally important, you know, that I actually, you know, instead of just sucking up and going and missing what I had to do, I, I had to cancel again. So that's why I'm hesitant to, to confirm until I'm a hundred percent sure, but I would love to go, you know, uh, I, I haven't good. told my wife yet that I want to go. It's, it's, it's a, 11 hour drive or I, I could fly, Ooh. I suppose. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, the fact that I finally get to talk to all these authors that I admire, you know, on our show, like I want to meet them in person now and you know, it's a good cause. And so I'm oh, pretty yeah. It'll fill you up. You'll, you'll run on that energy of being there for like a month. So yeah, it's, a, they're always a good time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Great. yeah. Thanks for coming on. Um, thanks I, for asking. Yeah. yeah man. Absolutely. Great to yeah, finally we'll meet come you. Back. We'll, come, we'll come back when we've got comic book stuff to talk. Talk about Absolutely. it. Come back anytime okay. if you want to come on. We're we're here, so we're easy. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Talk about yeah. this. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I definitely appreciate it, Richard. And um, your know, best of luck with the new books too. And we'll be spreading the word on those and looking forward to what you have coming out next year too. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. All right. You're thank welcome. You. We'll be back care. Friday night. Hope everyone stays living. We'll catch you on the next show.